As mentioned, I'll be sharing with you something. I'll be doing a lot of reading because I want to make sure to stay on track and to be accurate. Uh, I'll depart once in a while from what I've prepared. But I want to share with you a foundation, and I want to share with you over a series of several weeks the things that make us what we are. And I felt that in order to do so, I would give to you as the foundational teaching um, something related to our history, a history of this fellowship, which would include some elements of what the Lord has done in my life to give some of you visitors and all um, some insight into the heart of this ministry and uh, give you some insight into me as the pastor so that you might understand um, some of the things that should you remain for us for a while, that you'll be hearing. It'll give you a context. So I'll read verses 18 and 19 here in Isaiah chapter 43, and, and I'll get into my time with you. Isaiah writes, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness, and rivers in the desert. So I'll begin a series related to the essentials of our ministry. I especially desire to give insight into the history of this ministry because it can be helpful for some of you who might have a curiosity concerning this. As I mentioned a moment ago, the things that I'll share are already known by some of you, and for others it'll be new information. So the question I'll begin with is, how did Calvary Chapel of the Chino Valley come into existence? I'm going to begin uh, all the way back when I first met a young lady named Marie who became my wife, and uh, I'll start there. So when I met her and began dating her at that time, I was teaching two Bible studies a week, Monday nights and uh, also on Tuesday. I attended church on Thursday nights, on Sunday morning and Sunday nights. I was going to college. I went to Biola five days a week, and I played on two softball teams. I was going to lectures given by uh, Walter Martin. I later was attending an evening study in Downey. After being married, I attended school. I worked part-time. I continued teaching. I was teaching three Bible studies a week. I was attending church on Sunday mornings as well as Sunday nights. Eventually, Marie and I had our first child, Corinne. I worked full-time in Huntington Park. I taught two Bible studies, one in Norwalk, one in Roland Heights. I attended night classes at Cal Poly Pomona. I later went to Melody Land School of Theology in Anaheim, and after that I was taking classes at Cal State Fullerton. In around 1978, I served on a church board for Calvary Chapel of Claremont. We would meet after I attended night classes at Cal Poly on Tuesday evenings in Claremont. Marie and I would drive from Roland Heights to Downey for church. So we moved to Norwalk, where we eventually drove every Sunday to Claremont to go to church. At the same time, I was attending school in Anaheim. I transferred to Cal Poly in Pomona, eventually started teaching a Bible study on Tuesday nights, moved it to Friday nights, worked full time, and I quit school. When we first married, Marie worked up until the weekend of the birth of my daughter, Corinne. After Corinne was born, I tried to support our family by working a full time job making minimum wage. Like many newlyweds of our day, we started with very little. We had the cars we brought into our marriage, a 1963 Falcon and a 1976 Toyota. We had a convertible sofa that we slept on, some assorted wedding gifts, a $50 table and chairs, and a $10 sofa. We bought our first television for $99. It was huge. It was 13 inches. I was making $3.75 an hour. I was attending school so that I could have the GI Bill benefit of $500 a month, which helped to provide income. I received ordination in 1979, eventually was placed on staff at Calvary Chapel of Claremont. My first salary was $969 a month before taxes and tithe. We had a house payment of $500 a month. Marie received her college degree and began to work as a substitute teacher. I, I was an assisting pastor. During the uh, one and a half years I served in that ministry, 
Marie worked frequently, bringing home needed money to pay our bills. My VA benefits expired. We needed her check. When Corinne was 17 months old, we had David. And when David was eight months old, we suffered a miscarriage. I asked God to keep me from crying. He said no. <laughs> I have this terrible ability to be back at that place at that moment. And the emotions are still there. Forgive me. Marie became pregnant again, and when David was two and a half, we had Joseph. My son Joseph was three months old when we left Claremont. We didn't have a church to attend, and my sister-in-law, Patty, asked me where we were going to go to church. You see, when I was the assisting pastor at Claremont, the senior pastor who had ordained me into ministry resigned and left the ministry in the hands of uh, a younger man. A younger man who didn't appreciate me or my ministry at the church. He eventually, in a board meeting, he told me that I wasn't a pastor and that he was revoking my ordination and that I was going to be a counselor in the church. And I remember that conversation and I remember saying to him, there's only one thing I know that I am and that's I'm called to pastor. It's just not here. So I resigned my position there, and I left. And so when that happened, my sister-in-law, Patty, asked me where we were going to go to church. Now, my sister-in-law, Patty, uh, was the first person in my ministry who ever answered an invitation that I gave. And I had, I had Odin Fong, a friend of mine, had come to do music, and, and I gave a message, and nobody came forward. So I went into the back, and Patty went into the back, and her roommate, Felicia, went to the back uh, of the stage area, and she said, you know, nobody came forward. She says, I feel really, really s sorry for you. She says, so I better give my heart to Jesus. And that's how she got saved. <laughs> I said, that's better than nothing. And so, <laughs> and so she and her roommate, Felicia, both came to faith in Christ that night. Though nobody saw it, she's still with us to this day. Um, she had asked me, where are you going to go to church? And I told her, I, I don't know yet. So she said, w will you teach me until we find a church? And that's how we ended up planting this church. Uh, I've always believed that it's not the crowds that you want to reach. It's the individuals. It, it, people matter. It's not that crowds don't thank God when many show up, of course. But it has to always be the people, that one person that needs Jesus Christ. And, and that's how this church began, because I wanted to minister to her. We didn't have a church to go to yet, and that's how we ended up planting this church. This church originally was called Ontario Christian Chapel. And so we began ministry. And there was a lot of sacrifice. My, my screen door at my home in Ontario had rips in the bottom where my daughter Corinne, who was very little, and my David would climb and hold on to the screen. And their little feet pressed the screen out of the door. And they, would, they climbed and, and would cry there whenever I would leave to go to ministry or have to go do a weekend ministry trip. And I left it with the screen ripped out to remind myself that it costs to serve the Lord. Corinne's first year of life was spent sleeping between Marie and me. I worked. I went to school. I taught Bible studies at night. We lived with my parents for a year while I saved up money for a down payment for our first home in Ontario, which cost us $47,000. It just sold for $460,000. I should have held on to it. <laughs> Starting the church was difficult. It didn't begin without difficulty. When our church began, my, my salary in our church was 500 a month. We barely made ends meet. It was stressful. My wife, Marie, began to lose her hair and was diagnosed with alopecia areata, a condition that is stress-related. 
she lost a third of her hair. I made a small wage for around a month or two doing basic landscaping. Marie worked for Chino High School as a substitute teacher. We saw that as the grace of God and that she was given work for a full school year teaching Spanish. And we laugh about that because you know, Marie doesn't speak Spanish. At the end of the year, neither did her students. <laughs> Como no? <laughs> it was at this time that we began to learn something about John 12, 24, where Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He who loves his life shall lose it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Dying to self results in God moving in wonderful ways. When we began our church, our first Sunday morning had 25, maybe 30 adults. Less than 10 children, including two infants, Joseph being one of them. When this ministry began, the Lord gave me three specific scriptures. The first was 1 Samuel 24, 12, which says, Let the Lord judge between you and me, and let the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. He gave me that scripture because the pastor who had hurt me so deeply, I could have, I could have carried resentment in my heart towards him. And, and I could have lashed out at him and tried to to, to do things that were just not godly. And the Lord said, no, let me judge between him and you. You just trust me. I'll take care of it. So I let go of that. And the Lord had moved me to let go of that, to move on. But a year after starting this fellowship, uh, I called him up. And I said to him, I'd like to meet with you. And I gathered together with him in his office. And we had it out. We prayed. We embraced. And I moved on. So the Lord was teaching me from the beginning, let me do your battles. Let me fight for you. A second scripture was Exodus 23, 29 through 30, where God says, I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate, the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. So I saw that the Lord, by application, uh, was going to, going to move slowly in this fellowship. It wasn't going to explode in numbers, but it would grow gradually, and that's something we saw take place over the years. And the third scripture was our first message, the one I just read to you, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. He wants to do a new thing. So over the many years, I've seen the Lord fulfill this word to us. He has slowly but surely produced a new work in our midst, first in the city of Ontario, and now here in the Chino Valley. I first came to the Inland Empire in September of 1974. I was teaching a home study in Ontario. I eventually moved that study to Montclair. As a matter of fact, that study that, that I had in Montclair back in 1975 was in the home of John Mata, who does our offerings and teaches and all now and is on staff with me. Uh, I first met John. I call him John John because that's how I knew him as a six-year-old little boy. So I've known John John. I met John John first when he was six years old, and he's still a monster all these years later. <laughs> and so we had moved the Bible study to his parents' house in 1975, but in 1977 we came back and began ministering in Calvary until we planted this fellowship. When we began in Ontario in 81, there were around 80 churches in the city. We had to ask ourselves, why do we need to plant another church? And so we asked the Lord, what would you have for us? Well, we wanted a church that would be fresh, that would be vital, a, a church that was filled with the wine of the Holy Spirit. And we believe that Calvary Ministry embodied this. In Luke chapter 5, verses 37 through 39, Jesus said, no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. The old is good enough. 
And so the heart of this statement is that God wants to be alive in his church. We don't want to put him in a box of tradition. We want to remain fresh. We want to remain fresh in our worship, in, in our style of teaching, in the things that relate to ministry. And we want to let people know from the beginning to this day that God loves them. That's the key, and that's the heart of this ministry. And even though I'm an old man now, and I'm up here speaking uh, as an ancient of days kind of guy, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, interestingly enough, we went out with my daughter Corinne and her husband and kids, and it was uh, her husband Scott's uh, birthday, and, and we were at the table, and, and uh, our waiter was uh, uh, a guy who's been in pastoral ministry, and, and he was talking to us and sharing with us, and and he, he brings up, uh, he brings up uh, the Jesus freaks. And I smiled at him, and I said, that's what I am. And that's what I've been, you know, because they used to call us freaks. I mean, there was a, there was a, um, there was a song where uh, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, where he said, I almost cut my hair. It happened just the other day. Some of you might remember that song. If you do, you're as old as I am. You should be ashamed of yourself. But... <laughs> He said something about letting his freak flag fly. Well, a freak flag was your hair. And so they, the, the hippies were freaks. They called them freaks at that time. So we were freaks. When I got saved, we became Jesus freaks. And that's where that term came from, the Jesus freaks. And so I was a Jesus freak. So I told that guy, I said, yeah, you know, I said through my dentures, I'm a Jesus freak, you know. So... Again, when we started this work, we laid the pure foundation. Jesus is the chief cornerstone that the entire work is built on. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says, No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Here, where I'm standing, and in the platform in the main sanctuary, I wrote, before we put carpet, that scripture. Every time I teach, I stand on the sure foundation of Jesus Christ. Every time I speak, I'm standing right now on the scripture, no other foundation. And that's my heart in ministry. Jesus is our foundation. Our love for him and our service to him is what makes us what we are. Philippians 1.21 says, For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. So Jesus is not a name tacked on to a church to make it seem Christian. Jesus is the one we love, and it's Jesus that we proclaim. Over the years, I have seen too many using his name to further their own interest. Paul spoke of this in Philippians 2.21. He said, I'll seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But we made a decision to keep Jesus the center of all that we do. We met for the first time in my sister-in-law's rented home in Ontario. The front room was a sanctuary. The den and three bedrooms were children's ministry. I sat on a recliner. I taught barefooted. I, I used to teach barefooted until my mom told me one day, you know, son, I'm tired of looking at your feet. Would you put shoes on? And so I started wearing shoes. The next week that we met there, what happened is we did our Sunday morning and... Um, I said, I'll see you later. Um, if you want to come back, I'll be here. Because I had, gone to, I had gone to speak to Patty and Felish, really. And people came back. And when they came back, somebody said to me, can we record these messages? And I said, why would you want to do that? Who wants to listen to this more than once? And they said, we do. And so that's how we began to move towards recording. On that day, I, I gave what we call our four pillars, God's word, the worship of God, the witness of God's people, and the witness to his glory. And so I told him, I said, this is what we're going to do. God is guiding us in this, and God is going to do a work in us, and this is what we will be. We will attempt to teach the Bible. We will teach the word of God. Jesus Christ will always be the foundation of this work. We don't have a denominational philosophy. We believe in Holy Spirit anointing, not an education alone or natural talent. We need the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to teach the Word of God under the power of the Spirit. And we're going to make sure that Jesus Christ is the center of all that we do. 
Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5. He said, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. We're not celebrity-oriented because Jesus is all we need. Jesus in John 15, 5 said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. I still remember when my pastor Chuck came to to teach at a Wednesday night study. Our church was a few years old at that time. We were meeting in Ontario High School. The auditorium sat 1,200 people. It was packed on a Wednesday night. There were people not only in all of the seats, but they were on the floor. And Pastor Chuck went up. We used to have a picture of him at that particular study. He used to have it in the foyer. He went up and he taught. We had the uh, fire, uh, a fire marshal who attended our church at that time who came and said, I'm going to have to shut this down. This is dangerously overcrowded. So my, uh, one of my assistants took her outside to talk to her a little bit about it. it took about 40 minutes in his conversation with her because he wanted to make sure he understood everything she had to say, which gave Chuck enough time to finish the study. I know that's bad, but I don't care. So we walked out, and Chuck and I were walking out together, and I'll never forget this, under his breath as we were walking out together, Chuck muttered and said, who would have ever thought Ontario? I'll never forget that because for me, Ontario was the wages of sin. I would have thought the same thing. <laughs> who would have thought Ontario? You see, we need to depend on the Lord to produce his fruit to his own glory. And we need to know that it's through the teaching of the word of God that you produce health in a church. And healthy sheep will beget sheep. You can, you can put all your money into a budget and bring in the best speakers, the most famous, bring in the best musicians and entertainers, and all you're going to produce is going to be an entertainment place. It's not going to be a church. But if you center on Jesus Christ, if you center on his word, if you center on loving God with all of your heart with people of like mind, you have a church. And when you have a church, people stop being celebrity-oriented. Yes, there are people who will come to church because a special speaker is there. I get it. I understand. But that doesn't build a church. One time here in this church in the early 90s, some of you might remember a young woman named, who was a young woman at that time, Crystal Lewis. Maybe you remember her name. She was real big for a while, Crystal. We had her here. And this, when this, this, that's when this place was our our main sanctuary, and so that wall that's behind us here, didn't, it wasn't there at that time. There were actually uh, a, plat there was a platform there, and so we would seat a little over a thousand people, and it was a Wednesday night. And Crystal came, and she did her music. People liked Crystal. I liked Crystal. But I remember walking up right where I am right now, and I remember saying, listen, Crystal's, Crystal's concert's over, so we're going to take a break for a moment. Because you who came just for a concert who aren't really interested in God's word, I want to give you opportunity to leave. And people got up and left because they weren't interested in the word of God. They wanted to be entertained. So from the very beginning, I've, I've always, always believed that we're not celebrity oriented. It's Jesus Christ who's the center of everything. It has to be Jesus Christ or else it's not the church. It's just a program. And so if that's always been our foundation in this church. And that's how it went for the longest time and still is. We must always depend on the Lord to produce his fruit to his own glory. And we need to remember it's the healthy sheep that begets sheep. We didn't receive offerings for the first 15 and a half years of the existence of this church. We rented schools. We bought properties. We hired staff. We had outreaches went on the radio. We began receiving offerings because the Lord convicted me because I was proud of the fact that we didn't. I was in, uh, I had one of my board members call me up and he said to me, Dave, he said, I want to talk to you for a minute. And I said, okay. He said, the Lord has told me to tell you something. And I said, I'm listening. What? He says, it's time to receive offerings. It'd been 15 and a half years. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. He said, well, the Holy Spirit has put it on my heart to tell you that. Right around the same time, Raul Reese and I, I like to tease about him. Raul's a very good friend of mine. And, 
And uh, at the same time, right around that time, Rawl and I were invited to go minister in India. And so he and I went together to India, and we spent uh, almost, um, almost uh, 10 days or so ministering in India. And I'll never forget how we were in this, this room. And those of you who've been into India know that it's 100% humidity. There's no air conditioning. It is so hot in the room that Rawl decided to lay on the concrete floor to try and get something cool. And me, I was laying in the bed, no blankets or anything, just sweating. And I remember two things. One, I remember him yelling. I remember hearing this sound. Then him saying, what was that? Because something had crawled on him and was biting him. So I, I remember hearing, what's that? And then the second thing is the out of the darkness, I hear Rawl say, David, you need to receive offerings. And when he did that, I, I, that was a witness of two. When he did that, I knew the Holy Spirit was saying, it's time to receive offerings. And I came back and I shared with this church. I said, listen, I know that we've never received offerings. We had agape boxes. I know we've never received offerings. We've been able to do so much. But I have been convicted because I am ripping you off of the blessings of giving. I told the church that because God blesses the cheerful heart that gives. And I've been withholding from you the opportunities to be blessed by him. And that's why we began receiving offerings. It wasn't a, a desire to receive more money. It was a desire to have my people blessed, which I had been stealing from them, but not encouraging them in that. There are those who wonder why our children's ministry is separate from adult church services. We developed that out of an awareness of differing abilities for uh, people to understand, including children. You see, in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 2, it reads, Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. I looked that up with the commentators and all, and it points out that the small children, the children who didn't have the capacity to understand the teaching, were not included in the teaching. And that's part of what we do. That's why we, we teach our children according to their ability. But they'd never get anything from a study like this. Obviously, my style of teaching is expositional. I take that out of Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and 27, where Paul said, I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of all men. I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God. And so that's why I teach the way that I do. I want to teach you the whole counsel. We also emphasize worship. We believe that worship is inspirational as well as encouraging. And I've seen God move through worshipful praise. Because worship of God should be inspirational, we emphasize singing to Him. Worshiping God in song is not simply a prelude to the teaching. It's a time of intimacy with Him. And just this last week, when, or a couple weeks ago, when Dr. Heinsohn was, was with us, he said this. He said, some churches that I teach at are led by performers. He said, but this is a church that worships, and that spoke to my heart. I'm open to a variety of musical expressions of worship, including country. <laughs> and I love to praise the Lord. And so that's another pillar, witness. Witness for us is the need for fellowship in a world that People think they have friendships because they have a lot of friends on Facebook or whatever. Those aren't your friends, and you know that. It's sad. It's sad. I, I read it every day. I post. You know, I do. I use it as ministry. Of course, it's a great ministry tool. I use Facebook and other forms. But sometimes I read things that I actually, I actually, it makes me sad. Where somebody says, nobody's writing me back, or nobody's liking my posts, or I feel this, or I'm hurting like this. And I'm thinking... You need a human being. You need a person with a shoulder that you can cry on. You need someone who can look at you and eye to eye and can say, I love you. Not something out there that, that you'll never even know who's reading. People who will take advantage of you. People who will cut and paste and take excerpts of what you say and make fun of you to other people and, and their friend list. You know, I, that, I, I really believe in community. I really believe that 
What's lacking in the church today is a sense of needing one another. It's a sense of, of knowing one another. I mean, when you read your Bible, uh, the word one another in, excuse me, in the New Testament is used. There's over 50 times that one another is used in Scripture. Like when Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Or Romans 15, 7, where he said, receive one another. In Galatians 5, 13, brethren, you've been called to liberty. Only don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love, serve one another. Pray for one another. Exhort one another. You know, confess your faults one to another. It's a one another thing. The church at the beginning was all together in one accord when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. And the church is supposed to have a one another experience. It's very unhealthy when you don't have that. And then we wanted to have a witnessing church. Healthy sheep beget sheep. And the Jesus movement was and remains an evangelistic movement. I got saved, but I witnessed to my family. I witnessed to my friends, and I still share. As a result of desiring to reach people, We've developed the food box ministry, dinner ministry, hospital and home visitation teams, convalescent home ministry, new believers ministry, prison ministry that presently serves in six California prisons. We have lion tamers, a drug and alcohol abuse ministry. We have new man ministry. We have under his wings ministry support groups. We have Friday evangelism outreaches. We have a Pomona outreach. We have door-to-door -door outreaches. Missions to Mexico, missions to the Philippines, Costa Rica, Guatemala, as well as a Spanish language service here on campus. On Thanksgiving and Christmas, we provide food for families and fellowship, as well as gifts for kids, including the children of single parent homes. Our Easter services, men's conferences, women's conferences, and Christmas services have served to reach thousands of people throughout our community. We planted churches in, in Mexicali, in Fontana, in Upland, in Ontario, South LA, Ojai Valley, Montclair, in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, up north in Siskiyou, Redemption Hill in Lake Havasu, Great Falls, Montana, we, uh, in Corpus Christi, Madison, Wisconsin, Clay Allen, Washington. And over the years, we've seen God move. We saw God take a small Bible study and from the original members extend his kingdom throughout the world. Many of you have enabled us to broadcast the message of the gospel throughout the nation on 41 radio stations from Arizona to New York and many states in between. You've helped us to reach a new generation with the gospel of Christ, and we're reaching many through our Facebook live broadcasts. I look back over the years. It seems as if time has flown by. So much life has been experienced. We've seen many saved, baptized, equipped, used by God in wonderful ways. We've had children born into this fellowship, grow up here, serve here, meet their spouses here, get married here, and I've dedicated their children. Entire lives have actually been lived in the shade of this church. I look back with appreciation, but I look forward with anticipation because I believe God wants to do more. In Haggai 2, verse 9, it says, The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. I'm excited to see what the Lord has in store for us. I want Jesus to return in my lifetime, but should he not, I want us to move until he does. I want to live in the power of his Holy Spirit with faith for the future, and I want to make a difference. I want us to keep learning, to keep serving, to keep working until he returns. And, and I would like to sum up my feelings for this congregation with these words, where Paul in 1 Thessalonians 2.8 said, affectionately longing for you, you were well pleased to impart, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. I have been blessed to impart God's gospel to you but I've also imparted my life. You are, in many ways, my crown and my glory. I love you guys. It may not, it, you may not realize that. You may not even believe it. 
And I can't be the person who has coffee with you and goes with you. You know that. But know this. Know I love you. Know that when I stand up and I share my heart and I tear up like I am right now, you need to know you are amongst the very few people who ever see me cry. You need to know my wife doesn't see me cry as often as you have because I'm, I'm with you. My heart is open, and I'm telling you what I feel for you. And what I feel for you is gratitude and love. I love you guys with all of my heart. And so I'll close with a, <laughs> with a promise that I'll do the best I can to remain faithful to the Lord, to teach his word. And as my pastor Chuck said, I take my hat off to the past and I take my jacket off for the future because the best is yet to come. And Father, we thank you for this, this journey that we're beginning. We thank you for this first installment. I thank you for your history of working with us, how faithful you are to us. And we're grateful, Lord. So many things unable to be said in such a short time. But Lord, you have guided and you have always provided. And I just ask that we would never forget that. I lift up this congregation, and I ask, Lord, that you would have your way amongst us. I lift up those who are hurting in this place right now, as well as those who are rejoicing, that, Lord, you will be the center of wherever it, it, whatever it is. May it be joy, may it be sorrow at the moment, whatever it may be, be the center of that, Lord, and bring them to where you are, and keep them where you are. And, Lord, we ask that you would just keep moving through this series, Lord, as we build on it platform by platform so that we'll get an idea of who we are, what our history is, and what you want to do with us. So, Lord, thank you so much for the work you're doing, and may you continue to bless us. We lift up the needs of this congregation, every one of them, the emotional, the physical, the spiritual, and, yes, the material. We lift them to you, Lord, asking that you would provide. Because you always have, I know you always will. And Lord, may we remain faithful to you to the end.